In this episode of the Neil Wilkins podcast, I am joined by Brian Clayton, who is the CEO and founder of GreenPal, which, as we're going to hear, is a fascinating business for a lot of us to learn a great deal from because this business has over 300,000 active customers, is a multi million dollar business, but has been grown and has been scaled through search engine optimization and organic content. Now, for a lot of us, this is going to be quite insightful because I think a lot of people would assume that a scalable business, a business that grows, you know, literally year over year, uh, dollar over dollar, has to be funded by advertising. But as we're going to see in this conversation, Brian is going to share with us some nuggets of gold that are going to show us there is another way. And when I'm dealing with my clients, I'm often thinking, is there anything I can do on almost a zero budget? So real kind of bootstrap business growth. And that's where I like to start. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation. So welcome to the program, Brian. Neil, thanks for having me on your show. It's great to be here. I mean, where to start? Because, you know, I know you have so many things to share with us, but I, I guess for people who don't know Brian and uh, Brian's background, do you, do you want to share a little bit about your kind of backstory and how you basically created GreenPal? Yeah. Yeah. So like you mentioned, I'm CEO and co-founder of GreenPal, which is a platform that connects homeowners with small local lawn care services. So if you have a lawn and it's maybe gotten to be two or three feet tall, you can just download GreenPal, you pop your address in, and someone comes out and takes care of that chore for you. And GreenPal is a 10-year overnight success. My two co-founders and I have been at this for over a decade. But like, like you said, now we're, now we're nationwide in the United States, around 300,000 people using this app to get lawn mowing services and grown primarily through search engine optimization. Um, we learned in the first couple of years building GreenPal we would talk to our early adopting customers and they would tell us, you know, after I called friends and family recommendations or I maybe dialed a phone number off of a flyer, I would just go to Google out of, out of just frustration and I would type lawn mowing service nearby me. And that's how I would find the lawn mowing services. We kept hearing that over and over again. And we thought, you know, maybe we could compete in this channel. Maybe we could uh, be one of those uh, uh, options that come up when you type that into Google. And we quickly learned that, wow, that's, that's really hard. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, not as as I, it's not as easy as I hoped it would be. And, and it, it became clear that it was a bet the company decision, that we were going to have to uh, throw all of our weight into competing in, in organic search. But we did that, and after about a year or two, we got some traction, and little by little, the, the small numbers began to compound over time, and, and now we have 300,000 people using it, and we want to get to a million, and we'll get to a million just, just through Google organic search. I mean, th this is just so refreshing. I mean, it really is. I mean, I, I guess in... In lots of ways over the the decades and you know like you overnight oh, no, success it's, it's taken decades um it's, it's been something that i've been really on the search for an organization who can you know genuinely and authentically say they've grown in grown in this type of way because i think a lot of people would love to do this but would kind of say yeah it's okay but to actually scale we have to do it we've got to do it at pace we've got to do it because our investors need us to do it faster um, or that actually we're not so confident in the offer or the proposition isn't quite hitting the mark so well let's place a few kind of ads and then of course then they spend you know a significant amount of, of budget or their revenue um, on on advertising rather than actually trying to craft a, a business that is scalable in an organic sense so I'm really interested to know kind of that level of confidence that you must had um, back in the early days you know that first thousand customers that first thousand users of green pal I mean how did you kind of take that step to sort of be thinking let's do this as you say you know piece by piece customer by customer it must have taken a lot of confidence back in the early days that's a really good point that you bring up <clears throat> because i read somewhere uh that something like 70 percent or maybe 60 percent of all venture capital goes back into three buckets google facebook and amazon and so the, the model, at least for the last 10 years, I think it's starting to 
self-correct itself, but but it was, hey, you raise a bunch of money and then you go buy a bunch of distribution, whether it be Facebook ads or Google AdWords or, or, or Amazon ads, and you try to sell through those channels. And if it works out great, and if it doesn't, you know, good luck. And, and uh, I started seeing this, you know, when we were, when we were building GreenPal, we started in 2013 and, and uh, I would see uh, big headlines, Uber for home cleaning gets $40 million of funding. And then like literally 13 months later, Uber for home cleaning shutters its doors. And, and I, and I would see these headlines over and over and over again, that all these Uber for X ideas were getting massive amounts of venture funding and they would like do well for about 24 months and then they would just crash and burn. And it was because, like you said, the, they, they, they raised all that money and they bought a bunch of ads and bought a bunch of distribution. And it was kind of like trying to put rocket fuel in a Toyota Camry. It just, it just blew up. Uh, it just never took off. And, and uh, I didn't want that to happen to us. That terrified me because I'm, I'm reading these headlines of X, Y, and Z company folding. And I thought, you know, that's somebody's dream. That's, some, that's, that's a team working you know, seven days a week on an idea and, 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 and now they have nothing. And that was really, I didn't want that to happen to my team and I. And so we decided to go slow and low, uh, really practical. And the first two or three years, it was really hard because to your point, we didn't know it would work. Uh, we, the first year I wasn't certain that it would work and it wasn't until, uh, maybe you know 18 months in that, that it was i remember the day that i knew it would work very clearly because i was working on a saturday with my my two co-founders and something like 40 people signed up that day and i didn't know who any of them were and this was a big moment where i thought okay this this organic search stuff that we're doing is starting to work people are discovering my property discovering our website I don't know who these people are. They're signing up and they're self-serving through our platform and can, and transacting and conducting uh, business on our platform and get and solving a problem with what we've built. And I thought, okay, if I can just add a couple more zeros on the end of that number, then we'll have something. And so the way we got through those first few years was just setting very small goals that were, that were hard to hit, but they were small. And then knowing that if we, if we, compounded and grew them doubled them and kept doubling again and again that we would eventually have something and and we celebrated the small goals like they were really big ones we our first goal was we wanted to do a hundred transactions in a week uh that meant b matching up a hundred consumers with vendors and they would transact on the platform in one week and that took two years to to accomplish um, but I knew that if we got to a hundred, we could get to a thousand and then 10,000 and then a hundred thousand and so on. So these things don't add up, they compound. And in those early years, we were looking for signals that if we, if we could just get it to work at a very small kind of like atomic unit level that eventually we could scale. And that's how we got through it. And we set little small goals and, and just kept hitting them and moving on and, and, and hoping it would compound. Mm, this is such precious advice, I think, for everybody, everybody listening here, you know, including me, because this whole thing about patience, I know, you know, the likes of, you know, Gary V talks a lot about patience, a lot of the big commentators talk about patience, but the, you really were practicing that then, because it would have been so easy, wouldn't it, to almost like not believe in yourselves and every little hiccup, which inevitably, you know, a startup was always going to, you know, have little hiccups and little moments where, you know, by looking at the numbers, you weren't necessarily seeing what you hoped you were going to see. Because I can't imagine every single week and every single month was hitting the numbers that no. you desired. So it would have been, I guess, ebbing and flowing uh, during those times. So kind of, you know, being almost obsessed, I guess, about the numbers in those days, what was kind of pricing like without, obviously, you know, you're being very kind and, and generous kind of sharing the, the backstory here. But, you know, if, if you can share as far as you can, the, the kind of the pricing model, because that must have been quite a sensitivity in a market like this, where, you know, you're, you're not, you know, you don't have the big deep pockets of big, you know, as you say, overinflated investors coming in. So pricing must have been critical. Yeah, it, it really was. And, you know, you mentioned something that, that you, you, we were obsessed and we really were. We had a fire in our belly to see this idea 
take shape and live in the real world. And, and I think you kind of have to be obsessed to, to figure these things out and to work through things like pricing and work through getting your first thousand customers. You, you, somebody should describe you as like an animal. Like they should say, Oh, Neil, that thing, that podcast he's working on, he's an animal, you know, it's like, and not like, it like like he's like like a rabid dog trying to make this thing happen and and that's kind of how we were we were obsessed with the idea that we could build something that thousands of people could use and and the only way we got there was just through experimentation one you know trying one thing and it failing trying another thing and it failing and we did a lot of experimentation around pricing in the early days I thought that we were de delivering the cheapest way to get this service done because the dynamics of our marketplace are you sign up as a consumer, you get five competing prices from different lawn mowing services nearby you, and you can choose who you want to work with. And if you want to choose the cheapest one, you can. So that's how we were orienting the platform was, hey, this is, you know, you could save 20% on your on your home maintenance costs by using GreenPal or or uh, save five bucks a, a lawn mowing. This was the, the ad copy. And as we started, like, really, really talking to our customers at their kitchen tables, you know, every Starbucks uh, in, in we're from Nashville, Tennessee. So I know the inside of every Starbucks across Tennessee because because this is where we would meet with our customers and our vendors. They would always tell us, like, yeah, I mean. I, I want to pay a fair price, but what really matters to us is the reliability and the speed. We, we, I really just, when I used you guys, I needed somebody to come out today because uh, the last three services I hired on Angie's list or Craigslist or, or Thumbtack or whatever, they, uh, they ghosted me. They flaked or they didn't show up. And now my grass is five feet tall. I needed somebody to, today. And so we started really through those early conversations, started keying in on no price is not the value proposition, it's, it's speed, reliability, and consistency is what we're selling. And the price needs to be fair, but it, it really needs to be oriented around the, the ability to just order it off the shelf and get it done. And so once we started focusing all of our firepower on that as our value proposition and not price, then we began to start seeing that, okay, we're activating more customers, more customers are sticking around, we're making more money. So now we have more money to reinvest in other things. And so it, I think in those early days, really talking to your customers, belly to belly, like, like sitting down with them at, at their kitchen table and, and hearing them tell you why they decided to do business with you or didn't can help you key in on what your value proposition is, how price relates to that. Um, and if you need to be the, 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 the cheapest uh, solution in the marketplace, or if you're selling something else, because that quite possibly could have been like a save that the company the moment for us. Cause if we had spent a decade on orienting around price, we may not have gotten to where we are today. Mm. So this, this kind of customer satisfaction thing then comes from, you know, not just getting great reviews, but actually probably actively listening then, because I think what you're advocating here, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, you know, this is a two way, two way street, isn't it? This is not you just saying, hey, here's a service. If you like it, it's quite kind of a good price, right? You go buy it. Okay, now you're a customer. Great. We've got another one in our database. Actually, what you're doing is you're building longevity and a more kind of sustainable style of business by saying, no, we are actually listening to you. So yeah, we're looking for that great review because we want a good trust pilot score but actually what we're looking to do is to sustain a relationship with you and we genuinely will listen and and that's kind of really refreshing in this whole kind of sort of organic sustainable business piece because i think a lot of people would assume it's just about content but actually we're talking about relationship building even though this is a an, an e-commerce style business we're talking about building proper relationships aren't we Absolutely. I, I read a quote somewhere along the lines of, of, of this journey. Um, and I can't remember who said it, but the, but the, the mantra is listen to your customers or you will have none. And that is something I have to remind myself of every day uh, because it's free R and D the, that customer feedback, you know, a lot of times as, as founders, we want to pay somebody else to do the customer support or we want to pay somebody else to listen to the angry customer phone call or answer the, the, the pesky customer emails. But the reality is it's, it's, it's free R&D. It's, it's literally telling you everywhere your product needs to be improved. Your customers are telling you what they want. 
They're, they're telling you, they're helping you see blind, you know, blind spots that you, ne- you, know, you can't necessarily see. There's a weird thing that happens with every business where there's a gap that forms between the founder logic and the customer logic. And the founder is looking at the problems that the company solves from one perspective and the customers are looking at it from another perspective. And, and it's almost like they're, 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 they, they, they see two different things. And the only, the only way to close that gap, you're never going to close it 100%, but to try to close it sm- as small as you can is to talk to your customers. And I know this sounds obvious, but you literally have to be intentionally, as you grow, uh, artificially put that in your kind of daily workflow. So you know, even today, you know, we have thousands of people using it using the platform every hour to, to get lawn mowing, I still do at least an hour a day, sometimes two hours a day of customer support where me as the CEO, I'm doing live chat. I'm answering emails. I'm answering the phone call uh, because I don't want that gap. I want to try to close that gap between founder logic and customer logic as much as I can. And still to this day, I, I get insights around those conversations with customers. Like, oh, you know what? I never really thought of it that way. Um, yeah, we should tweak that. And then when we have a meeting with with stakeholders and a meeting with with key people people on our team, I can speak confidently. Said, well, actually, I, I'm looking at my notes. I had five conversations with five different customers last week that that are talking about this issue, and that's why I think we should change it to make it like this. And 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 that enables you to speak confidently. You're not just going with your assumptions and shooting from the hip or going with your gut. It's actually rooted in customer feedback. And so no matter what stage of the game, I, I, I think it's important to, to intentionally put that in your workflow. You know, I read a book, uh, one, of the, one of the Amazon biographies, and they talk about how, you know, Amazon still to this day puts a, a teddy bear in an empty chair at their conference room meetings. So they might have 10 people around a conference room table, and there is a chair with a teddy bear in it. And, and, the teddy, and that represents – it used to be an empty chair – and it and represents the customer. So they started putting a teddy bear in there so it didn't look weird. And so they were reminded of this. The customer has a seat at this table. And as silly as that is, it's like this is one of the world's most valuable companies that still has to intentionally do this. And so I think those things can be helpful. And I think just flat out doing your own customer support in the early days, all of it. And then as time goes on, you know, try to artificially bake in an hour or two a day can be helpful for free R&D. And so you don't lose your way. I mean, I, I really do applaud you, Brian. I, mean, I think you're being quite modest in terms of, you know, sort of how you're connected and committed here as, you know, sort of one of the, the founders and leader of the um, of the business. I mean, everybody listening here, this is Brian, who is, you know, running a multi million dollar business and he's still spending an hour a day listening and interacting with customers. All right. I, I really want to emphasize that point to everybody listening, because that is just so valuable that everybody really, really pays attention to that piece. Multi-million dollar business, the CEO is actually engaging with customers. So, you know, this is really has to be at the heart of kind of leading by example, doesn't it? Because I'm guessing as you scaled the business, I'm not thinking necessarily the first year, I'm talking about probably in more recent times now, where you know, managing and motivating the team within the business. I mean, that kind of activity really is leading, really is leading by example, because, I mean, I've heard this adage uh, said many, many times is that, you know, marketing is too important to leave to the marketers. Mm -hmm. So kind of everybody has a part to play in this, don't they? This kind of gathering of intelligence and insights from the market, from customers. There's literally everybody on the shop floor to, you know, production to, you know, irrespective of what kind of business you're in. Everyone's got a part to play in this, haven't they? Yeah, that's and that's kind of how I've tried to develop my style in 22 years uh, of of building companies is is the authenticity and the ability to roll my sleeves up and get into the trenches with my people and and never and never leave them there. And and that's something I've learned the hard way. I've I've tried to do it the other way and it's never worked for me. And because every time I've tried to delegate something that I haven't done myself, it's always blowing up in my face. And so if you're trying to set up an initiative in the business and, and you haven't, you know, you, you, you as the founder, you as the chief, as the CEO, whatever you want to call yourself, don't have the 80-20 acumen around whatever the hell it is they're trying to do. It's really hard to delegate. It. It's really hard to lead it. 
And, and uh, you know, you th- think about like somebody like Elon Musk. You know, Elon Musk has, what, five different huge businesses, and he could probably go into any nook and cranny of any of those companies and speak confidently about the, the rocket science or, or the, 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 uh, the marketing uh, of, of whatever it is Tesla is doing or, or the, the business strategy around what SpaceX is doing or, or what have you. He can, he can literally, uh, he's, he's done it. He's, 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 been, he's slept on the shop floor. He's, he, he, has, he has rolled up his sleeves and gotten into the trenches with his people. And if you can think like that, where it's like, doesn't matter what corner of the business, what we're trying to do, I've done it. I may not have done it great, but I've done it to a point where I understand that the 80-20 kind of Pareto principle of it, it can really help you delegate it in a way to where the company achieves what it's trying to achieve. Every single time, I've, whether it be like when we first started GreenPal, I didn't know how to code. I didn't know how to write software. And so we tried to, to, to outsource all of the code development to a shop, to a development agency. And that was a total failure because we didn't know how to build the software. We didn't know how it should be architected. We didn't know how the user interface, what it should look like. And, and so then we had to like teach ourselves how to code and build software. And once we did that, we then built a team around us. So I think it's important, you know, to, to have that authentic style of leadership and the ability to say, okay, doesn't matter what we're doing. I've either have done it or I am doing it and, and I'm delegating it from a standpoint of stewardship that this is how we do it here. This is how, why we want it done, it done this way, not abjuration where it's like, okay, you handle it. I don't want to deal with it. That never works. Mm. So there'll be, there'll be a lot of people listening to this who are business leaders and, um, you know, they may well be in micro business or in a startup and, Kind of really trying to find their way, much as I guess you were sort of back in the day, uh, in the early stages of uh, of Green Pal. Um, how do you kind of ensure everyone's aligned around company goals? I mean, this is one of the things that you know you need to obviously maximize the value of all the resources that you have. And again, particularly in the early days when you know the purse strings are very tight, and you know yeah. time is of the essence to survive. How do how do you kind of figure that alignment out? Yeah, I've always tried to keep it super, 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 super simple. So we're always trying to move one or two numbers. And so for us, the goal always has been the revenue that we put into the pockets of small business owners. If, if we can make the, 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 the livelihood of people that earn their living in the landscaping business easier, more prosperous, more lucrative, then the platform succeeds and everything else just just splinters off from that if if we can make them more money with less headache and so we always measure that okay so how what is the revenue growth of the of the vendor partners that use our platform how, what is the gross market value of the revenue that's flowing through the, the platform on a week over week basis and that's an active metric because if we're not matching buyers and sellers and they're not using the platform and continuing to use it then that then that number suffers it doesn't grow it goes sideways or, or, or goes down. And so that's what we focus on. And, and, and we try to figure out why does that matter? Why, why, do, why, why do we care about that? And it's literally the, the making, a, making, the living in, 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 making a living in the lawn mowing business is hard. It's like you wake up at 5 a.m. every morning, you're sharpening lawn mowing blades, you're out in like the 100 degree heat mowing grass, and then you have to get home and do bookkeeping. It's like, that's who we think about. Like, how do we make that person's life better and and we celebrate their success stories. You know, it's like, hey, because Green Pal, I was able to put a down payment on a house. Thank you for hooking me up with 100 new customers this year. Or I was able to buy a, a riding commercial mower, which is th- those things are like 20 grand. You wouldn't think it, but they but they're expensive. Or I was able to pay off credit card debt or I was able to pay off medical medical debt or or whatever. We we literally celebrate these stories and we talk about them in our in our stand ups. We have pictures of them on the wall. We we really, really celebrate when they're succeeding on the platform because that's why we get out of bed in the morning. That's why it matters. That's why our success matters because we're helping small business owners in this industry grow their business with less hassle. And so that's that's how we orient everybody around why what we're doing and, and how we measure that success and keep everybody on the same page. I think it's important that you go up to any employee in the business, you know, whether you have five people or 500, everybody should be able to answer that question. You know, why are we doing what we doing, what we are doing and why does it matter? 
Um, if you don't, then, you know, you're kind of managing from the spreadsheet and, you know, that can work too, but it's not as fun and it can make it harder. Mm. So this, this whole passion around, I, I just want to go a little bit deeper in this passion around the, you know, the stakeholders in and around your business, because on the one hand, yes, obviously, you know, employees, part of the team, those direct kind of connections, obviously important because that's the core of your business. But I'm really fascinated by this whole idea of, you know, being driven by the community, the community of stakeholders around you. There, there's something really kind of authentic and and real about, you know, the way that you've described that, that, you know, you wouldn't exist as a business unless you really nurtured those relationships and really thought kind of deeply about, you know, the value that, you know, everybody around your organization is going to be getting from the offer. It's almost like you're the center of an ecosystem, really. I suppose that's quite a grand way of putting it, but but you are, aren't you, really? And without those relationships, without building that community, you, you just don't exist, do you? There's, so there's a real kind of purpose-driven element in here, isn't there? It, it really has to be if it's going to work. Um, it has to, because if we don't have, right now there's 32,000 contractors that use the platform to run their business. And if they don't love it, if they're not part of a community where their lives are being improved by it, then we don't have a product or service to sell to consumers where they can then order them off the shelf, so to speak. And so it starts with that. It starts with the community of the, of the vendors that use the platform. And we, we, uh, one way we're able to keep in touch with them on a daily basis is we invite them all into a big Facebook group. And so we've got a, a Facebook group with thousands of these providers and uh, I participate in that thing at least, I mean, I'm checking it at least 20, 30 times a day, me personally. And so I'm in there and I'm answering questions about uh, frustrations in the lawn care industry because it's a hard industry. It's, it's, just, it's just a hard business. Um, things that they wish the app would do differently. Um, uh, ways that they think that the app might be tilted towards the consumer side and not, not towards the vendor side because we always have to strike, strike a balance between buyers and sellers. And so we're always trying to one foster that community, but also to make the, uh, the 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 feedback loop really frictionless, where they can tell us, speak directly to me, thousands of them, um, what they wish the app would do differently to make their life better. And then we listen to that, and then we bake that into the things we're executing on. If we don't get that right, if if they if they look at it like a, like a transaction, and they look at it. Uh, as, as something ancillary and not core to their business, then we don't have a service for, for consumers. So we started that off on the right foot in the early days. The first 500 service providers had my cell phone number and they would call me seven days a week. And back then the app really stunk. It wasn't that great. Didn't have the features it needed. And so I kind of needed them to fill in the gaps, so to speak. And so I would give them free coaching on how to grow a lawn mowing business. And they would, in an exchange, they would use this 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 clunky app to submit quotes and complete work and keep it updated on the schedule and so on and and that kind of filled in the gaps that enabled us to focus on the consumer side in the early days. Well, it started off that way and then we kind of spot we kind of grew and dovetailed off from that hand cranking of a community to okay now we we've got everybody together in a in a group and we can discuss things on a on the fly and. And, and kind of keep everybody in one place and, and, and keep the back and forth going rather than it just being some uh, faceless uh, corporation that you're interacting with on a screen. I want them to feel like it's part of a community and, and, that, and that we help them win. And if we don't get that right or if that, ever, if that ever gets screwed up, then I think the consumer experience will suffer. And so we're always mindful of that. Because mm, at the start of this episode, we, we were talking about, you know, price and we were talking about the data side of things and you know the fact that okay you don't necessarily have to be spending you know lots of deep advertising budgets to you know grow a business but actually there is a price to pay and I think you've just highlighted there Brian the price is absolute total commitment to the community and to customers yes. because that, that that's a real commitment I mean this doesn't come you know at half pace you have to be all in don't you and I, I guess as you're scaling this you know social media in itself obviously we all know that you know social and digital marketing and stuff is you know and has been over the last 15 20 years you know the focus for anybody looking to to do kind of organic growth 
but you've really kind of optimized that in terms of this this word community, haven't you? I mean, what what other things have you experimented with within social? Yeah, social media for us, we have tried like hell to make it a uh, an acquisition channel where people would discover what Green Pal is. My grass is four feet tall. I need a lawn mowing service, and they discover us on social media. We we have tried for years and years, and and we and we cannot figure out a way to make it as effective as a simple Google search. And so we, we've almost given up on it as a as an acquisition channel. But social media for us is a place for for us to accumulate evidence of this is who we are, this is what we do. This, this, is, this is photos of the work that gets provided on our platform. This is what we stand for. This is, this is uh, the type of messaging we're putting out there in terms of content, in terms of helpful how-to content, things of that sort. And so it's, so it's, a, uh, it's almost like a reference check almost. When somebody is, is stumbles across GreenPow and, and they don't know what it is and, 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 okay, yeah, I can use this to get my lawn mode. Well, let me do a generalized search for GreenPow and boom. You know what pops up our our Instagram page, our our Pinterest page, our our Twitter page, and so you can see. Okay, this is a vibrant, uh, active, healthy concern. They're putting out content every day, and it, and it's actually good looking stuff. And 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 on Facebook they have reviews, and I can read reviews about what other people are saying about them. And okay, well here's a situation where a customer had an issue, and they and they handled it, and and in, in a public forum. And and so, I think if you can't figure out much like us, how to make it an acquisition channel, then you can you can figure out a way to make it like a retention channel or an activation channel. You know, like somebody's considering using you. They've already found you. Now, before they put that credit card number down, they might check you out on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest and, and use that as a way to kind of get them over the, the hump. And, uh, and that's that's how it fits in for us. We can't just because it doesn't help us get new customers who don't know who we are, we can't ignore it. We have to invest in it. We have to nurture it. We have to make sure it looks world class and premium. That way, when somebody is is, is figuring out who Green Pal is, they can go to those channels and find out for themselves. Mm, I, I have to admit, I was I was a little bit rude then. I was listening, but I, I kind of took my fingers to the keyboard because I wanted to capture that moment of social media can be an activation channel. I love that phrase. That that is so good because it it kind of means there is a purpose to it. There's right. some value from it, but don't necessarily people listening to this obsess if you feel like you're failing because you're not getting new customers through it directly. But right. it's there as a supporting tool, a supporting beast, if you like, kind of waiting in the wings to to say, "Hey guys, we are a live concern." I guess you know as a um, predominantly uh, online business obviously you know there is a physical product or service at the end of the uh, the transaction i guess having that kind of activation there is a kind of it's a nice reassurance isn't it really as part of the overall customer experience that's important isn't it for this scalable organic growth that we're talking about exactly especially you know in in my world we're we're hooking people up with with 35 40 dollar lawn mowings not a whole lot on the line, but if you're selling a big ticket item, uh, whatever, wedding rings or whatever, um, you may not be able to get people who don't necessarily are, are not familiar with your brand through social media. That is hard. But if, if they're considering doing business with you, they're going to check those places out. And if they're and if it's a ghost town, they're gone. And and you need to to make it you need to make it look like what it is, a successful, thriving, ongoing business that, that is engaging with customers, that's putting stuff out there. And just because that's not bringing in new people, it is helping people get over the hump and do business with you. Um, I, I, I know this because I, I ignored social media when we couldn't figure out a way to unlock it for new customers. I ignored it for two or three years. And, and then I, I started hearing from customers saying, I checked you guys out on Facebook, but you haven't posted in three years. Like, are you guys in business? <laughs> and and it, it, all it took was one conversation where one customer told me that for me to figure out, damn, no, we need to make sure it looks great. It needs to look premium. Um, and, and so we, we fired it back up and, and we don't, we don't, uh, as, as, as a, like a percentage of a pie chart of, of effort going into marketing, spend a whole lot on social media, but we do enough to where it looks as premium as it can be. And it looks like, okay, yeah, this is, 
This is an ongoing business. This is a live, thriving business that I want to do business with. Mm, I love that. That that is so so powerful. I think I'm always um, in my sort of conversations with people and interviews and things. I'm I'm always on the lookout for the little moment that is just oh, that is so sweet. And I think you've just captured it there, Brian, because that and I'm so grateful for how transparent you are about this, because this is a, an important, ongoing live business that is serving um, hundreds of thousands of people. And you're, you're being really transparent here with how you do this. And, you know, I'm so grateful for, you know, your, your time sharing here, because I think a lot of people will get a real wake up call there. if They've got that tired Facebook page. Right. And I think we've all been there. We've all been yeah. there. Oh, yeah, and, totally. And again, where you've got almost like semi-dead social networks that you even forgot that you set up back in the day. Um, and the Pinterest one was an interesting one because I'm actually in that trap now. I've got a Pinterest account. You could go there. Have I posted there in forever? No. So I think, you know, we can all take that little wake up moment there. So you know, thanks for that one, Brian. That was really a nice little uh, moment where it's like, mm, pay attention, Neil, not just the audience. So uh, yeah, very grateful for that. Just kind of building on that point and and one kind of because I know you're, you're a very busy person. I, I'm really grateful for the time that we've had here today. Just one kind of final point, um, just on that whole thing about innovating and, you know, kind of growing the business. I mean, obviously, balancing this kind of need, I guess, to always stay kind of ahead and be innovative and be listening to the customers and spotting that next moment where you think, oh, there's a bolt on or there's a piece of added value for the service. Um, and obviously staying ahead, you know, the competition in that regard. How do, you, how do you balance that with maintaining, you know, a strong focus actually on the core business? Because innovation and core business, they don't necessarily always sit as, you know, particularly sort of happy friends alongside each other, do they? <laughs> yeah, one often comes at the expense of the other. And in the early days, you know, it was real simple for us. We had to nail it and then scale it. We couldn't – there was no reason – when, when we were trying to figure it out to, 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 to scale something that wasn't working, it would have been like pouring gasoline on wet leaves. So 90% of our time was on the core thing. How do we, how do we make this thing work like Uber where you push a button and it does, the lawn mowing does happen on time and, and it does work like running water. And, and that took us five years. And then as time went on, we, 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 we got that kind of down pat and got the core experience predictable and consistent. And then we had to figure out a way to get more people connected with it. And, and I read a quote uh, by, by Jeff Bezos, and, and he says, the, the, the thing that I love the most about the customer is they are divinely discontent. Today's new innovation is yesterday's old news. And, and, you might think, well, what does that matter? That's Amazon. That has nothing to do with me. Of course, they need to innovate. Well, the reality is we all compete with Amazon in, in, in some way. You know, Amazon is not in the lawn mowing business. Amazon is not in the home services business. But Amazon is in the business of almost making magic happen in a sense that I can order something and two hours later it just shows up at my doorstep. And, and, and so I'm competing with that in a way because – Amazon is, 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 is conditioning the consumer to expect that type of magic with everything that they, that they do online. And so now me as you know, the, the, the purveyor of a platform that hooks lawnmowers up with, lawn, with customers, it's like that has to work almost as good as Amazon where you push a button, somebody comes out and mows the grass in the same day. So now I have to innovate on you know, one or two days is not good enough. I got to figure out a way to, to cut that time down to make it where it happens almost as magical as, as ordering something on Amazon or, or ordering an Uber. And so in a way, I'm kind of competing with that experience that Amazon is conditioning cu customers to, ex to expect. And, and so for us, you know, it's, it's always how do, we, how do we make this, this service that we provide cheaper, faster, smoother, more reliable, more consistent, and, and, and how do we unlock little small innovations in that loop? And you cannot – you cannot think that the experience that you have today will will be enough a year, two or three years down the road, especially with everything that's going on with AI, um, that, that things are going to radically change and radically get faster and smoother. And, and so you've always got to be looking for how do I make this thing more convenient, 
more cost effective, more reliable? How do I minimize the, the, the negative experiences people are having with the platform? Today's numbers are not good enough because you, you will get left behind. That's just the way it is. And that's capitalism. That's what makes it, that's what makes it great. And that's what makes it fun. Mm, and it's what makes us, you know, passionate um, decades in. And as you're going into the second decade, I guess, or you know, deep into the second decade of the business, it, it feels still like exciting times. And there's something really infectious about, you know, just kind of hearing the story, but also some of the background. And, you know, it's, it's really, really, really uh, great for all of us to kind of um, get that kind of insider's look, if you like, to, uh, to GreenPal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the details to uh, yourgreenpal.com and the link uh, in the description below. Um, Brian, this has just been a fascinating conversation. I'm sure so many people have had a huge amount of value from this. Um, any final sort of thought from, from your perspective, if, if there was one thing that you could recommend to the audience to do, just one single thing um, to really kind of maximize this whole idea of, of getting sustainable, scalable, organic growth, what, what would it be? Just one thing. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the way to build something sustainable and long lasting and particularly organic, it, it, it boils down to consistency and it boils down to daily habits and routines, you as the founder and, and the business. It's a lot like it's a lot like dieting, you know, or going to the gym. You can go to the I, you can go to the gym today and look in the mirror tomorrow, you will look exactly the same. And it's like, you know, if you do it a week, it's pretty much the same. Month, eh, maybe a, a year, you go, you go consistently for a year, you're gonna look totally different. And 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 building community and building traffic and building SEO is exactly like that. And uh, I read a quote by uh, Eric Thomas, who's a motivational speaker. And he said, he said, don't get mad uh, about the results you didn't get for the work you didn't do. And uh, that hit hard because at the time I was at a plateau with, with, with uh, my fitness journey. And I was like, damn, he's right. And, and then I started thinking, you know, that's exactly – how how organic search works in terms of creating great content and you know I'm, I'm mad traffic is not up well don't get mad about the the result you didn't get because the work because of the work you didn't do and it's like like well we really didn't put out 30 new pieces of content last month like we said we would and so yeah no i can't get mad and so i guess that's a that's something that works for me and so i i'll, I'll leave that as my last piece of, of advice for your listeners hopefully it, hopefully it helps them get unstuck like it did me yeah, and I have to say that one hit hard with me as well because I keep <laughs> promising myself I'm going to do it. I'm not bad. I'm just not great. So I need to get great at doing exactly what you just described. Brian, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for, for sharing everything about GreenPal and you know your journey and the, the ups and downs and the opportunities available for everyone to learn from. It's been a you know, real pleasure. really enjoyed uh, this episode. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed it.